This is the second revision video in a series about the GCSE chemistry topic of chemical analysis. Chemical analysis is the process of establishing which chemicals make up a substance, and it's important both for identifying unknown substances like at a crime scene, but also for maintaining quality control of substances that are being manufactured. So you might want to test a product before it leaves the factory to ensure that it always has the same physical properties. In this video, we're going to look at chromatography, with a particular focus on paper chromatography, which is the required practical for this unit. By the end of this video, you should be able to describe how to complete the required practical, in which you make and analyse a paper chromatogram. This includes both qualitative analysis and quantitative analysis, where you calculate an RF value. You should also be able to describe the advantages and disadvantages of using instrumental methods rather than human methods for analysis. One way that you can identify whether a substance is pure and which different substances that mixture contains if it isn't pure is by using a separation technique called chromatography. There are several different types of chromatography, but in GCSE chemistry you will mainly have encountered paper chromatography because this is one of the required practical activities. All the different types of chromatography are used to separate mixtures and analyse what is in them. And they're all comparative methods, which means rather like fingerprinting, you need a database of samples to compare your sample to. So you can't just do one chromatogram and then say, well, my sample contains this and this and this. What you need is a bunch of other samples that you already know what they are to compare your sample to. And then you can say, is it the same or is it different? All types of chromatography have two phases. The first phase is called the stationary phase. In other words, it's the part that doesn't move. So in paper chromatography, this is your piece of chromatography paper. Then you have a mobile phase, which is able to move and carry your sample through the stationary phase. So in paper chromatography, this will be a solvent, um, usually water when you do it in the classroom, but you might have also used ethanol or something else. The substances that are in your sample are going to be separated out based on how well retained they are by the stationary phase. In other words, are they more attracted to that stationary phase, in which case they'll stay still and not move very far, or are they more attracted to the mobile phase, in which case they'll travel quite a long way. In paper chromatography, how well retained the substance is corresponds to how soluble it is in the solvent. So things that dissolve very easily will travel a long way, whereas insoluble substances that don't dissolve at all will just stay on the start line and not move. For the required practical, you should have set up and analysed a paper chromatogram. In most schools, this is done comparing a few different felt tip pens to see whether they contain the same mixture of inks. In setting up the required practical, there are some key points to note. You need to draw a start line to ensure that when you analyse your results, you know how far the sample, i.e. each ink, has travelled. This start line should be drawn in pencil, because a pen might run and interfere with your results. You wouldn't know which ink had come from the sample and which ink had come from the start line. Whichever solvent you're using for your mobile phase, this needs to start below the pencil line. If you add too much solvent, or if you don't have some way of stopping the chromatography paper from falling into the solvent, then your samples will just run out into the solvent, rather than being drawn up the paper, which is what we want. If you're using a particularly volatile solvent, such as methanol, something that evaporates easily, or if the chromatogram is going to run for a very long time, then you may want to add a lid to prevent the solvent from evaporating. As we've said, chromatography is a comparative method, and the simplest way to compare your sample to other substances is by putting a little bit of each one of those substances on the chromatogram. We call these known substances standards. At the end of your chromatography, you should also say that you will calculate an RF value for each ink or dye or colour, and we'll look at how to do that in just a second. So you can see here I have the start line drawn in pencil, I have one standard to compare my sample to, I'm using a splint to stop the chromatography paper from falling down into the solvent, and then finally on the right hand side you can see the finished chromatogram. We can analyse our results both qualitatively and quantitatively. In terms of the qualitative conclusions we can draw, we will do this by looking at the numbers of spots and comparing these to spots of the standards, those known chemicals where we know what they are. It's important to note that a pure element or a pure compound will produce a single spot in all solvents. In other words, if you looked just at water, 
you could have two compounds which have exactly the same solubility in water. And so they would travel the same distance before they were deposited on the paper. But then you might find that if you ran that same chromatogram in ethanol, then because the solubility of those substances is different in a different solvent, they would then separate out. But if I run my sample in lots of different solvents and I always get a single spot, that tells me that it is a pure substance. So each of my six standards here are pure substances. When I run the chromatogram, I just get one single dot. But my sample contains three different substances, three different colours. And it's probably worth pointing out here that although we do use paper chromatography to separate out colours, your exam paper is going to be printed in black and white. So when they ask you how many different colours does the sample contain, what they're asking you to look at is how many different spots are there. So this sample here contains three colours, even though all of the colours on my paper are black. There are three dots, so there are three colours. Then I'm going to compare those three dots to the standards. So you can see that I have one dot at the same height as the dot for A, and that tells me that my sample probably contains substance A. And then I have another dot at the same height as substance B, so my sample contains substance B. And then there's a third dot, and that doesn't correspond to any of my standards. So that is still a third mystery substance, and I don't know what it is. But I can say conclusively that my sample doesn't contain C or D or E or F because I don't have a dot that corresponds to any of those. Now, in a classroom situation, you might have had a sample of ink and you might have had three different pens that you wanted to compare it to. So it would be quite realistic for you to run one chromatogram with your sample of ink and your three different pens put in there as standards and to run them all and then you could just look at them and compare have the different samples got to the same height. But when we're thinking about industrial chemical analysis and maybe trying to analyse a sample for hundreds or even thousands of different compounds, it just wouldn't be realistic to put every single one of those samples on the same chromatogram as the sample that we're trying to test. It would need to be huge and also we would need huge amounts of those samples to include them every time we try to analyse something. So we need a way to be able to compare our sample to those standards without running them afresh every time. And this is where we come into RF values or retention factor values. So the idea of an RF value is it's a number that tells you how soluble was a particular substance. And it's actually, um, it's a fraction where the distance that the substance travelled is divided by the distance that the solvent travelled. So obviously the distance that the solvent has travelled is the maximum distance that the substance could travel because our coloured ink isn't going to suddenly jump ahead of the solvent. It's being carried by the solvent. Um, so if a substance is super, super soluble and it stays in that solvent for a long time and doesn't get deposited until the very, very end, then we're going to have an RF value of 1 because the distance that the substance travels and the distance that the solvent travels will be the same. At the other end of the spectrum, if we had a substance like the standard C here, which was completely insoluble and didn't move off the start line at all, then we would have an RF value of 0. And then most substances are going to fall somewhere between those. So when you calculate RF values, they must be between 0 and 1. This sort of represents 0% to 100%. You can't have something that's gone further than 100%. And we would expect that different substances would have different RF values if you... Um, if you do a chromatogram with a different solvent. So I could have a substance that has an RF value of 0.8 in water, and it will always have an RF value of 0.8 in water, but if I put it in ethanol, it might have a value of 0.7 instead. And that would be consistent for ethanol. If I did it with ethanol again, I would get 0.7 again. So in order to work these out, I'm going to need to measure the distance travelled by the substance, and I'm going to measure from the start line to the very centre of that dot, and then the distance travelled by the solvent. So we call that line that the solvent has got to the solvent front. And then I would divide the length of that blue arrow by the length of that green arrow, and I would get a number between zero and one. These are pretty straightforward calculations, but it's always worth having a practice. One thing that it's worth watching out for is making sure that the distance travelled by the spot and the distance travelled by the solvent need to be measured using the same units. So it's fine to use centimetres or to use millimetres, but you need to be consistent in your two measurements.
The other thing to be aware of is that the RF value doesn't have any units, because the units on the top of the fraction and the bottom of the fraction cancel each other out. So you're just going to have a number between 0 and 1 as your answer. So pause the video, have a go at these 10 questions, and then we can check the answers together. So for question 1, you should have divided 3 by 4 to get 0 0.75. Then for question 2, we should have 0 0.9. For question 3, 0 0.4. For question 4, you need to be aware that the water moving, that's the solvent, has been measured in centimetres instead of millimetres. So we either need to do 16 divided by 48 or 1.6 divided by 4.8. And so we get an answer of 0 0.3. Then likewise for question 5, the ethanol has moved 50 millimetres. So we do 4 divided by 50 to get 0 0.08. And then for question six, we've started to move things around slightly. So hopefully you noticed that the solute was moving 0 0.6 and we're going to divide that by 30 millimetres. So that's going to give us 0 0.02. And then for number seven, 0 0.2. For number eight, 0 0.4. For number nine, 0 0.225. And finally, 0 0.6. The final thing we're going to talk about is why we might want to use an instrumental method rather than a human method. And this applies to all sorts of situations, not just chromatography. Why would we rather use a digital thermometer and a data logger rather than standing around measuring a reaction with a thermometer ourselves? The three key advantages are that instrumental methods are accurate, which means they're more likely to give an answer that is close to the true value. They are rapid, or in other words, quick. And finally, they are sensitive. So in other words, machines are precise and are likely to be able to detect very small quantities of a substance or to identify very small changes in a value like temperature or mass. Disadvantages of instrumental methods are that they may be more expensive and they may still require highly trained personnel to operate the instrument. Thank you very much for watching and I hope you found that a useful introduction to chromatography and in particular the chromatography required practical. If you did find it useful, then don't forget to like and subscribe for the gas tests video coming soon. And if there are other topics that you'd like me to cover, just let me know in the comments below.